Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Demonstrating Sustainability Through Standards. My name is Marcy Weber and I'll be the education team moderator for today's presentation. This uh, presentation, we are a registered provider with the American Institute of Architects, Continuing Education Systems. Note that this webinar and associated slides should not be used as a substitute for competent engineering support and expertise. And this course is copyrighted and not eligible for reproduction. And here's the team that's providing this course for you today. Our speaker today is Jeff Bradley from the American Wood Council. And our engineering moderator is Director of Educational Outreach, Lori Cook. And behind the scenes is our education administrator, Kim Paulson, and myself, Manager of Education and Accreditation, Marcy Weber. So now let me give you over to Jeff Bradley to begin the discussion on sustainability and standards. Hello everyone, I'm Jeff Bradley, the Director of Sustainability Standards for the American Wood Council. Thanks everyone for joining us today and to talk about sustainability and standards. As you probably saw before, here's a quick course description. Uh, not going to read this all, but we hope to give some basic primers on how we go from some of the, the basic building block standards up through the process into some of the green building standards that exist. So here are our learning objectives for our course today. It should be noted that this course will be by no means a complete assessment of all the varied and nuanced standards or green building writing systems and codes that are out there. This is intended to give an idea about how some of those requirements flow up through the standards into the sustainability space that folks might see from the build side. So a little bit about AWC. The American Wood Council is the trade association that represents the structural wood product industry in the US. Our members make things like dimensional lumber, aka two by fours, OSB, glue lamb, and mass timber products. Our industry employs over 450,000 people in wood product manufacturing jobs and support additional jobs in the forestry and other industries. Our products come from a renewable resource that is grown by the sun while providing habitat, water, and recreational values to the people that live around the forests. We're improving our work by developing a life cycle inventory database to support our EPD development and working with the forest landowning sector to ensure our fiber sourcing data is up to date. So why are we interested in these standards and processes for demonstrating the environmental benefits of building with wood? Put simply, it's because people, governments, companies, designers, and architects understand that the construction industry overall is a major contributor for the generation of carbon dioxide equivalent that is being added to the atmosphere. As you can see from this slide, there is a lot of CO2 that's being added on a yearly basis and quite a bit expected by 2050. So what happens if we start building with more wood? Well, we have the opportunity to increase the carbon pool in our urban areas while maintaining and growing our forests. Harvested wood products act as a carbon sink when incorporated into buildings and that carbon is stored in the structure over the life of the buildings. In the meantime, other trees regrow in the forests where the harvested trees have come from, adding to the carbon stored in the forest sector overall. And at the same time, carbon is not being released from the production of other materials such as concrete and steel. Just to build on that a bit, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is the UN body for assessing the science related to climate change and providing regular assessments of the scientific basis of climate change, its impacts and future risks, and options for adaptation and mitigation. In the most recent AR6 report that was published in March of 2023, the IPCC reiterated that long-lived wood products can be used instead of other more greenhouse gas intensive products as an option for mitigating climate impacts. And this quote is straight from the IPCC. And it says, sustainably sourced agriculture and forest products, including long lived wood products, can be used instead of more greenhouse gas intensive products in other sectors. So, to do that, we need to work to incorporate that kind of thinking into the codes and standards 
that they rely upon. Let's get into some of the how with, some, with a bit of a primer on LCAs and EPDs. So what is a life cycle assessment? An LCA is a tool or method to assess the environmental impacts that a material, product, process, or service imparts during its lifetime. We do generally rely upon ISO 14040 and 14044 to do so. Here's a basic primer on what an LCA works to accomplish. It is more complex than what we are depicting here. For example, the different stages associated with the production of wood total almost 65 pages worth of documents, which are all then fed into a whole holding LCA that work to take all, well, as many as we can be done, impacts from the building rolled up over its lifetime. So as mentioned, LCAs are complicated and are perhaps not the easiest to interpret quickly and efficiently. So EPDs were made as a generic method of communicating information in LCAs in a comprehensive, easy, or way of disseminating that information. One way to think of EPDs is like a nutrition label we see in a supermarket on a piece of uh, food or a box of cereal or something like that. It allows us to effectively communicate data about the environmental attributes of products. A less complicated approach than reviewing the full LCA for a product. Most people have probably heard of program operators, entities like Underwriters Laboratories, NSF International, SCS Global, and ASTM all certify, validate, and in some cases maintain thousands of standards related to quality performance and sustainability, and at the same time act as program operators for EPDs. Entities like ISO create and maintain standards that are internationally agreed upon by experts in their related fields. EPDs are promulgated by program operators who vet their own EPDs before submitting them to a product category rule technical panel. And then they are subject to review by ISO standards and third party review. And then they receive an environmental product declaration. Now, we've already mentioned EPDs and environmental aspects of our products. What do these terms come from? And how are they created? ISO is one of the places we turn to when we look for international standards that serve as the rules for how we go about developing EPDs, PCRs, and associated environmental communications. So now what is ISO? ISO is a private standards development organization. It's made up of a federation of 164 national standards bodies. Uh, ANSI is the US national standards body. And every country gets one vote. So as many interests as there are in the room when it comes to the mirror committees at ISO, there is one vote that is going to be made at the end of the day. So we have to come up with a consensus at the national level and then come to a consensus at the international level. So there are ISO standards on a whole multitude of topics. It could be about making a product, managing a process, delivering a service, or supplying materials. Standards cover a huge range of activities. Experts work to develop these standards through mirror committees that we call technical advisory groups or TAGs in the US. The technical committees that make up the backbone of EPDs and PCRs fall under TC207. More specifically, subcommittee three on environmental labeling also known as the communication of environmental aspects of products and services, as well as subcommittee five on life cycle assessment, that is develop the rules on how to complete life cycle assessments. Just a quick note due to me serving in some of these committees, the opinions in the presentation today are my own, not the opinion of ISO or any other group. So how does this work when we get to make and communicate these claims? This is the vision based on the consensus that was developed out of the newly published ISO 14020 standard, which specifies general requirements intended to be applicable to all types of product related environmental statements and claims. We won't touch on it much here, but ISO 14021 
is certainly a document worth noting. It's used by the FTC Green Guides as a basis for claims made by organizations in the U.S. around the environmental aspects of products. Things like recycled content, compostability, and more can fall under the 14021 self-declared claim standard. In fact, the chasing arrow symbol that you see everywhere originated in the ISO 14021 standard. And getting back to how we make EPDs, ISO 14025 is the governing document on how we produce EPDs in the environmental labeling space, right there with the red circle around it. A new standard that you'll see referenced more and more in the marketplace around EPDs is ISO 14027. The 14027 standard for product category rules is relatively new and published in 2017. It's intended to provide principles and requirements for the development of a PCR that could be used for the creation of either a footprint communication or environmental product declaration. These requirements were formally and still are to some degree included in 14025 itself. The 27 standard expands upon those and provides some additional guidance. Since we at AWC are in the construction sector, it's also important to note that ISO 21930, Core Rules for Environmental Product Declarations of Construction Products and Services, acts as a layer on top of 14025 and is specific to construction EPDs. You know, stuff like dimensional lumber and OSB and other products that AWC members make. This sector specific document that would fit in somewhere around here in the process. 14025 is still the controlling document at the end of the day. The full requirements of 14025 are, of course, in the standard, but it basically lays out the program requirements for your program operator, how to use the LCA methodology laid out in the 14040 series of life cycle assessment standards, and how to put together product category rules. These are spelled out in detail within the document. As mentioned earlier, on top of the requirements in ISO 140, 20, 25, 27, and 140, 40, and 44, we in the construction sector follow 21, 930. This document provides additional guidance that works for construction products and gets us a step closer to our EPDs. In the case you were wondering with that laundry list of standards, yes, ISO does charge by the document. Now, our EPDs are limited in scope right now to A1 through A3, as it is not always possible to have good information on where or how our products will be used for the purposes of EPDs. A variety of models out there do go a bit further, but that's where we start getting into whole building LCAs, where we have a better idea of the ultimate fate of the building products once they've been installed, as opposed to our product EPDs, where we don't really know if someone is going to be using a 2x6 in a building, or as formwork, or possibly in their raised bed garden. So how about sourcing? Well, sourcing in the associated biogenic carbon is included in our EPDs, and thanks to the sustainability and managed healthy forests that we have in North America, the biogenic carbon is treated as not having an overall impact to the atmosphere, following the recognition from the US government as well as the UN IPCC committee that forest products are linked to the land that they come from. ISO 21930 lays out several methods on demonstrating sustainability of the resource. In the case of our EPDs, we rely upon the US Forest Service forest inventory analysis data to, to demonstrate the growth drain ratio in the US is positive. The forest carbon cycle is pretty important to us in the forest sector. When trees grow, they pull CO2 from the atmosphere and get bigger, put on more volume. And then things like fire, insect disturbances, land clearings, and harvest take that carbon out of the forest and put it somewhere else, usually heading back to the atmosphere eventually. But temporal scale here does matter. In the case of harvest, we can turn that carbon into things like buildings, furniture, and more to prolong its life while new tre trees grow. ISO 21930 requires that growing stock of the country that the wood originated from 
has net carbon stocks that are stable or increasing for the carbon entering the system to be considered sequestered carbon. At the end of life of our products, the carbon is tracked and then reported as an emission. So the figure here shows the growth removal ratios for forests in recent history. North American forest practices are among the world's best and the amount of forested land in both the US and Canada and the forest inventory and wood supply has been stable for decades. Forest standing inventory is affected more by growth than removal right now and forest mortality due to climate change, insect, disease and fire does also need to be taken into account. While the forest mortality rate has been steadily increasing, the overall rate of loss remains less than 1% of growing stock. This means that the overall standing inventory of softwood and hardwood continues to grow, even with the harvest levels and natural mortality being factored in. Since 1952, the growth removal ratios for both softwood and hardwood demonstrate that growth has exceeded harvest and the U.S. has not been de depleting its forest resources from a timber volume standpoint, even during periods of high demand. So this is a picture of a thinning project on federal lands. Because of the increasingly popular use of engineered wood products, which have the ability to utilize lower grades of dimensional lumber and convert them into stronger products, it also offers an opportunity to utilize materials from forests that have been devastated by insect and disease, as well as complete thinning projects that reduce the risk of wildfire. Everything from mass timber to products like eye joists can be made from these thinning projects, increasing the amount of work that, in this case, the Forest Service can do while sequestering carbon in products at the end of the day. Here we have some data showing how much growth is occurring in managed forest lands and how much is harvested on a yearly basis and how many board feet is still remaining in the forests. This is not to say that we should begin to indiscriminately increase removals of trees for lumber, but rather our forests continue to grow every year and we do have the capacity to utilize our forest resource while maintaining healthy forests out there for a variety of reasons. On top of the reporting that goes into our EPDs, you may have also seen labels on forest products that go beyond the base level of sustainability that we demonstrate through those EPDs. Forest certification systems have three main components, certifying forest land, certifying sustainable forest sourcing, and chain of custody systems to track those and recycle content claims through a supply chain. These are the key players in the standards world that ensure logging, fiber sourcing, and forestry operations are indeed sustainable and not just greenwashing. It should be noted that in the past, there may have been more of a disparity between some of these programs in their standards writing that occurred, but now these programs and standards largely result in similar outcomes on the ground, and you'd be hard pressed to point to one forest or another and tell the difference between the management program. Again, this is a, a pretty complex area and this is a very high level explanation of, of what's happening in that space. So having that large number of systems and types of claims out there combined with forest practices laws at the state and municipal level, along with requirements that public lands have to meet, there was a need to try to classify those systems into something that's a bit simpler for incorporation into that next level up, AKA building rating systems and, and green codes. ASTM D7612 is intended to fill that role, providing a method for easy classification of different levels of systems from legal, not so much an issue for the US and Canadian wood, but certainly important for wood imported from outside North America, to responsible, those that are sourcing from programs that were previously noted, as well as some of those forest practice laws that were mentioned earlier, to certified sources also those programs noted previously and some other um, types of programs out there that, that have that same classification. Now, responsible sourcing is extremely important for U.S. manufacturers through the land ownership makeup that we have here in the U.S. where around 60% of the private lands are owned by small family forest landowners, small tracts of lands that add up to be a lot but which also means 
that they usually only harvest once a generation and don't have the time or resources to certify their land directly as a larger corporate landowner might. For a mill that wants to demonstrate sustainability, they need to use the responsible sourcing um, level to demonstrate their sustainability while they are sourcing from those small private landowners. So, pulling back a bit to the basic sourcing requirements and what goes into EPDs, let's briefly go over an example on AWC's website. So this is the transparency brief, a short and sweet version of our North American industry-wide EPD for dimensional softwood lumber products. Things like two by lumber, four by fours, etc. As you can see, this lays out what product category rules were used and the software used to calculate the impacts from the lumber, as well as the declared unit. So these are the impact categories that are specified in the PCR, and they line up with the requirements that were laid out in ISO 21930 and 14025. Now keep in mind these are for a specified unit, in this case the one cubic meter of solid softwood lumber. This information can be taken in combination with whole building LCAs to understand how material choices can impact the carbon footprint of a building. And that carbon footprint of a building is really that first category there on global warming potential. So you'll hear people refer to GWP, global warming potential, embodied carbon, CO2 equivalent. Those are, are largely the same thing. Sometimes you'll see that they have slightly different meanings, but can be used fairly interchangeably. So we won't get into it today, but consider taking a look at other industry-wide EPDs from concrete, steel, etc., to help put these numbers into context. And I'll give you a hint, we do pretty well when compared to other conventional building materials. We'll get into that in a little bit. So EPDs provide a lot of information and can certainly be a useful tool in understanding the building product impacts. But to really understand the building itself, we need to move up to the whole building where we can do a life cycle assessment of the structure and its components. A whole building LCA is the gold standard of understanding how two building designs compare to each other. This illustration is from ISO 21930 and describes the different life cycle stages that can be considered when performing a whole building LCA. I'd highly recommend that folks interested in learning more uh, check out the Woodworks website, which has some great resources, tools, and more for doing whole building LCAs. As you can imagine, when doing a whole building LCA, there are a number of factors that can play into the analysis and results. For instance, do you want to include energy and water use in the analysis? What about parking? Or what components of the building should be included? Is it worth including things like paint? What's the building service life? ASTM 2921 is a document that has been developed to set some of those minimum requirements and is intended to provide parity between the two building models that are being developed. The goal being to have two buildings that fulfill the same requirements and don't have changes that, that really change the functional nature of that building that would uh, make them hard to compare. So, speaking of parking, it would be pretty easy to show lower impacts by removing parking from the structure of the building and putting it in the lot outside. Or doing something like, say, comparing an eight-story building to a 10-story building. In those cases, we're not really comparing apples to apples and um, using something like 2921 to set those guidelines is, is pretty important. Now we, we do, when we look at things at AWC, tend to focus on the structure and envelope of the building, as those tend to have some of the biggest influences on the overall whole building LCA that's being completed, and they also have some of the best data out there available for understanding that. So doing an LCA, we can look at the carbon emissions associated with production, and results can be compared across materials. This chart shows the difference in carbon emissions associated with lumber, steel, and concrete on a per ton basis. To get something a bit more comparable, we need to turn that into an assembly, the next step towards a whole building LCA. 
This gives a breakdown of one of the components of most interest to the folks that I work for, the walls, floors, and roof assemblies. Sorry, no paint. As you can see here on the slide, there are some fairly significant differences in performance between a wood assembly and a steel assembly that serve the same function in a building. So EPDs do provide a lot of information and can be a useful tool in understanding building products and their impacts. And sometimes there may be value in comparing EPDs within the same category. Folks may have heard of various programs operating at the state and now federal level requiring the purchase of some of the dirtiest, aka highest in body carbon products that have EPDs that demonstrate they meet at least the industry average of embodied carbon compared to the industry averages in places like California. These types of legislation and regulations tend not to include wood as it is an inherently low embodied carbon building material. So bike clean is that concept. Great to do for some of those high embodied carbon materials that can really use to see their footprints reduced. It has less of a benefit for wood as our in incremental improvement that you would see is gonna be far less impressive and we are currently a low embodied energy material already. So by looking at the strengths of various materials when compared to their embodied carbon, we can determine where those high embodied carbon materials make the most sense and where we can use other materials like wood to lower the embodied carbon of a building. AKA we can, can select the best of multiple materials so the best overall material can be specified. And we can do this during design. So we've addressed how we utilize standards to communicate our environmental aspects, how wood and other materials are used in buildings, is then addressed by numerous entities and standards writing organizations. There are numerous options for obtaining guidance on green building, or perhaps learning guidance depending on your municipality. And these are a few of the standards that are out there and, and provide some of that information. So in USGBC's LEED system, there are a few ways that these standards come into play for achieving points. The LEED system establishes standards and benchmarks for environmentally sustainable construction. For sourcing wood products, they can earn one point for utilizing lumber certified by Forest Stewardship Council or from wood harvested under categorizing wood and wood-based products according to their fiber sourcing. Um, and that's the, the ASTM D7612 standard. And this standard again recognizes entities like FSC, SFI, PEFC, and the tree farm system. There are also points for submitting environmental product declarations and completing whole building LCA. The Green Building Initiative's Green Globe system includes many similar methods of achieving points for utilizing whole building LCAs sourcing and EPDs. For sourcing wood, Green Globes has an, has an integrated approach that includes other environmental attributes like recycled content, regional sourcing, and more. The Hall Building LCA system does reference the uh, ASTM D2921 standard that we discussed earlier, and it also includes points for submitting a number of EPDs from different products. So ASHRAE 189.1 is a little bit different from Green Globes and LEED in that it is written in a code enforceable language and serves as the technical content of the International Green Construction Code that the International Code Council puts out. The current version still has very similar requirements for sourcing EPDs and whole building LCA, but it has them set up as two compliance paths that are options for a project to pursue. So instead of the, the tact that is taken by uh, green Globes and lead where you can earn points separately for those things you you basically have to choose in 189.1 whether you want to be doing that sourcing pathway that includes EPDs and recycled content or if you want to be doing a, a whole building LCA Now, the federal government has begun to incorporate some of these concepts into their building and sourcing programs as well. 
For instance, the General Services Administration has updated the P100 standard, which is an internal document used by GSA for designing their buildings to include whole building LCA. And it's focused on the embodied carbon of those materials. And to bring it back around to the standards, they do use the ASTM D2921 document for comparing performance of the two buildings. GSA has also been directed by Congress to create what's being referred to as a library of buildings. The idea here is that there would be a set of base buildings or, or target buildings that would provide a representative set of buildings for a number of different building types that could then be looked at for uh, comparative reasons when you're completing a whole building LCA. So having and understanding what kind of baselines there may be for existing building stocks can really help us improve the practice of whole building LCA at the end of the day and, and generally achieve a greater real, real world uh, savings on those buildings. Not only will this help the federal government as they build, but it's also going to be a great boon for the private sector as this information will be accessible for all. And I would be unsurprised if this information found its way into all sorts of tools that currently exist out there in the marketplace. While it doesn't really focus on wood, I did want to mention that the Inflation Reduction Act also includes funding for GSA to utilize materials with substantially lower levels of embodied greenhouse gas emissions produced by GSA in construction. This provision has been limited to the, the dirty materials that are out there, so the, the steels and concretes in the world. In the back and forth that is the government process around this, which involves going back and forth between EPA and GSA for developing these determinations, um, there has been recognition of the inherently low embodied carbon nature of wood products. But as of right now, that has not been included in the program and is, is certainly a gap that needs to be filled in the future. So EPA is also engaged in the space, as I alluded to, um, starting with an executive order back in 2021 that asks for recommendations about the use of EPDs and how to increase the quality dat of data provided by the EPDs. Um, quick side note, you might hear from a colleague about how we're improving the data in our EPDs this fall. So the Inflation Reduction Act also included a boatload of funding, some 250 million worth, for EPD assistance, as well as some funding, about $100 million worth for a carbon labeling program. Um, EPA is also involved in the Buy Clean um, S programs that GSA has implemented, as I discussed. And like the program that GSA has, um, the EPA programs have a pretty strong focus on those high embodied carbon materials. So we'll have to see how they play out as they're being implemented now. And we'll also have to see how wood, which is an inherently low embodied carbon material, will end up fitting into that program. So speaking of the future, uh, we do realize that there's a gap in the knowledge and the standard space that needs to be filled in to better communicate the benefits of using our products in the marketplace. There are projects out there now that are demonstrating carbon benefits from building mass timber buildings, and in some cases being able to associate those carbon credits in the voluntary market for those projects, which is a, a pretty exciting thing. So there is there is recognition out there. We are still a little limited on the standard side. So part of that is, is when we think about the forest carbon cycle, we have this great story to tell. And this is a graphic from Dovetail that's showing what the International Panel on Climate Change has continued to state, and has said again in their latest AR6 report, namely that there are ways that we as a society can benefit from the forests by using them not only as a carbon sink in the trees that are existing in the forest directly, but also utilizing the harvested wood products that AWC members manufacture. Things like biomass fuel, burning wood logs and stoves, building with wood versus higher embodied competing materials, and utilizing wood fiber as a replacement for plastic 
all have dramatic and long-standing sustainable impacts. Utilizing more wood as a replacement for conventional building materials can reduce the amount of embodied carbon in those structures. And also utilizing things like paper bags versus plastics can also have easily recognizable environmental benefits and are co-products that go along with the timber that comes out and it goes into buildings. So how do we set up some of those guidelines on how to do that? One way we'll be looking back to ISO, where there is an international TC that's currently working on a number of these concepts throughout the supply chain. So this TC 287, Sustainable Processes for Wood and Wood-Based Products, is working on this three-part series on calculation of the carbon balance it, throughout the, the value chain. So there's going to be uh, one standard looking at those wood and wood-based products and the carbon flowing through that, uh, one focused on forest management units, as well as a standard that is looking at the uh, calculation of displacement effects through substitution. So when someone decides to switch from a building made out of uh, concrete or steel to using a wood building. These drafts are all in the early stages of development, but they certainly do have the potential to provide a methodology for showing some of those benefits that go beyond what we're able to communicate about in our EPDs. Um, I, I did also want to mention the development of the ASHRAE ICC Standard 240P. This document is intended to be used to calculate both the embodied carbon on the building itself, basically the whole building LCA side of things, while also including the operational carbon in the building. The operational component is one of those optional things in ASTM 2921, as long as you're being uh, equal in treatment between your two building models. I think part of the concept for the inclusion here is that one would be able to determine the benefits, or perhaps lack thereof, of doing things like adding extra insulation to the structure. This document is also very much in draft form, but it will be interesting to see how this develops and fits into the suite of standards that are out there already. So with that, um, thank you for joining me. I'm now happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Jeff. And before we jump into Q&A, I am gonna take control of the screen here and share something that is related to what Jeff was discussing with us today. All right, there we go, all right. Um, so Jeff was talking about, uh, specifically was about talking about ASTM D7612 and its use and how uh, how can we tell if a product is sustainably sourced? And AWC has a brand new tool on our website. Here is the, the URL, awc.org slash wood dash sourcing. And the wood sourcing tool is designed to help users better understand where their wood products are coming from and the safeguards in place throughout the supply chain to ensure sustainability measures. The tool will provide greater insight into the sourcing of wood products used in low and zero carbon construction. And AWC will update it annually, excuse me, will update it annually with data from our LCA survey. The initial pilot project was funded by the Softwood Lumber Board and the U.S. Endowment for Forestry and Communities. All right, and I'm going to give the screen back to Marcy here, and then we're also going to get Jeff here uh, so we can go through some of the questions that you all have submitted while we were talking. So, uh, Jeff, are you there? You unmuted on me? Yep. Ready when you are. All right, great. Awesome. Well, first off, thanks for a great presentation. Uh, the first question that came in was related to the GSA wood building system options. So will GSA have wood building system options for their library of buildings uh, like timber frame or, or even log frame? 
Well, I think there's going to be a uh, process that GSA has to go through to determine how they're going to build that library of buildings. Um, when it comes to, to timber frame and log frame, um, GSA is most likely going to be ha having to look at buildings they would be either most likely to build, already have in their portfolio, or uh, coming up on deck. So I, I think those kind of uh, considerations are going to play into the, the buildings that end up in this library of buildings. Um, hopefully, as that process continues and that data is is fed into the uh, the federal government's uh, LCA Commons program. They can they can add to that uh, to include buildings that might not be those that that are just within that GSA space. Okay, great. Uh, okay, um, so not all engineers are familiar with the term biogenic carbon. Uh, can you talk about this term a little bit more and explain how its treatment at impacts embodied carbon for our building products? Sure. Uh, so whenever uh, someone like myself in the wood industry talks about biogenic carbon, we're really talking about uh, carbon that is on a uh, human time scale that's been been grown in a tree or in a uh, another agricultural product that is then moves through the supply chain either as as a uh, component that's going towards the uh, energy used to do something like dry the lumber or the the actual carbon in the component itself and in our EPDs we we do go through and feel free to go to the AWC website and take a look in more depth at some of our transparency briefs or EPDs but that as that material enters the system uh, you get a, a credit for that and as the material exits the system it is subtracted um, and that's a little bit different than how fossil carbon is treated in EPDs which is generally simply a, a negative on the uh, on that amount of, of carbon that is utilized within the system. All right. Can you speak to some of the issues faced and some of the efforts being undertaken by the wood sector relative to whole building LCA, uh, things like end of life uh, deconstruction or carbon storage? Yeah, so when it comes to whole building LCA, we are working to have some better representations and data around what is happening at end of life. Um, at the IPCC level in the harvest of wood product category, there one does actually, uh, interestingly enough, uh, get credit for or is is uh, is inclusive of the carbon in a wood product that ends up in a landfill. Um, we are also through things like mass timber, um, getting uh, getting better at the design for deconstruction and the promotion of that. Uh, there are some colleagues at AWC who are far more uh, better uh, able to speak to, to those efforts. Um, and we're also working on, on things like the uh, ASHRAE 240P that are attempting to look at the uh, whole building life cycle that includes the operational carbon in addition to the carbon that, that is needed to uh, construct the building and the, and the embodied carbon that is contained in the uh, various building materials. So we're engaged in a, in a number of the different steps there to help demonstrate the, the value of our products from a uh, carbon perspective. Awesome. Uh, we've had a couple of questions come in related to our EPDs. So I am going to uh, go ahead and share my screen one more time and show our website that has our EPDs and transparency briefs on it, if that's all right with you, Jeff. Yeah, please do. Yeah, all our right. EPDs and, and transparency briefs are, are all
all published on our website. Yeah, so we had we had a few questions come in on them, so I will just uh, start rattling them off. And if you have something specific on one of them that you'd like me to click on, just let me know. Uh, so the first question is: Is how often does AWC update its EPDs? Our EPDs are updated on a five-year rolling basis, so we're we're getting very close to the the re-update process right now. And that's in line with an uh, ISO requirement or something along those lines? Correct, yes. Um, both the product category rule and EPDs are, are updated regularly on, a, on at least a five-year basis. And that's, that's pretty consistent throughout the industry. All right, great. Um, so the EPDs we have on our website, can you talk about, are these generic EPDs? How would designers go about using these if they were, uh, for example, trying to earn maybe like a lead credit using an EPD? Yeah, so to, to earn a lead credit for these, um, you would you would include these in your in your documentation when you're submitting your your information for that credit under uh, product, I believe it's product transparency for uh, for lead in particular. Um, you know, this being an industry wide, um, I, I believe lead uh, counts those as uh, a partial point, so it would require the the uh, um, use of, of some additional EPDs to to go along with the wood that's in the building. So think about other materials there to to work towards achieving that point. Um, you're also able to, you know, contact manufacturers to see if they have any additional information that might be helpful as you're, uh, as you're building, particularly for some of those um, more complex products like uh, uh, the, the mass timbers and the CLT type buildings that, that may have uh, product specific EPDs available. All right, great. Um... Let's see, uh, I guess, how, how would these EPDs compare to the generic EPDs that the Canadian Wood Council published? Um, so I, I think we're, the US and Canada are generally aligned on these. Um, in, in the future, there's probably going to be some uh, requirements in Canada that that move towards uh, uh, Canadian specific EPDs but uh, at, at this point in time in 2020 I think we're we're pretty solid on on uh, those two being the same um, I, I do want to back up to a, a question about uh, dates on EPDs and and just to clarify I think I might have misspoke slightly our, our current EPDs were published in 2020, so they will be up for uh, revision in 2025. All right, that's an important clarification. We appreciate that. Um, okay, here's a question, a general question on ISO. So you, you mentioned when dealing with ISO standards, there, there was a federation of 164 nations. How does that work with, with a universal standard when we have such varying regional differences and, and interests across the globe? Yeah, so that's a, a really good question. And it, it can be a challenge to come up with a document at the international level at some, at some times. Um, for, for documents like EPDs and uh, the development of LCAs, fortunately, a lot of those requirements have uh, had some pretty good alignment at the at the international level, but it can take a lot of time and a lot of people uh, getting together to to develop that consensus in order to move forward with a document that that everyone at the international level can agree to. Um, sometimes that that does result in standards that that are a little I'll call it perhaps confusing. To, uh, to interpret, um, and at times that is, is when an organization like uh, ASTM might step in. Um, the ASTM D7612, I think, is a good example of, 
a place where forest practices are are different enough throughout the world that perhaps having something that's uh, a little more uh, focused on North American practices makes sense. Um, ASTM is an international body, but they do have a fairly strong uh, North American focus. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll just add to that, uh, ASTM, um, the uh, whole building uh, comparison uh, standard that's out there, that also I think is an example of, of somewhere where um, the ASTM document is providing some guidance on, on how to do a comparative whole building life cycle assessment um, that that was somewhat lacking at the the ISO level at the time of, of uh, publication for that. All right. Uh, so I, I know many engineers that I'm friends with personally. Uh, we're, we're a type of uh, people that we aren't really going to do something unless it, it makes sense or more often we're required to do something. So with regards to whole building LCA, um, can you think of any instances uh, where there would be a requirement for a whole building LCA on a project? I think you may have alluded to perhaps some federal guidelines. Yeah, so the uh, the the federal guidelines that I that I mentioned, the P100 standard, um, that is something that is coming into focus as a as a requirement for for GSA as they look to build new buildings. Um, there are, in terms of requirements for LCA, um, I think the, the closest thing that gets to that is probably the, uh, the ASHRAE 189.1 tool where it is a pathway. So you have to choose between um, submitting EPDs and, and other information regarding recycled content, um, uh, forest sourcing if you're using wood products and, and a few other things in there like multi-attribute standards or doing a whole building LCA. So um, it, I, I'd say it's, it's getting there, um, but it, it's not there yet in terms of a uh, building code requirement. Mm -hmm. um, and again, in the future, it's the, it's the best tool for really demonstrating the, uh, lower embodied carbon content of your building. Um, you can do things like the, the buy clean ask programs for some of those high embodied carbon products. And, and I think those, those programs work really well for certain materials, like say concrete, where you're, you're able to do some things to, to really lower the amount of, of cement in that and still still at the end of the day have the same um, uh, product characteristics that you need to perform in the building. When it comes to something like wood, that's that's a little more difficult and, and we already have such a small embodied carbon level that, that you're really not gonna gain anything. And so that's that's one of those spots where a whole building LCA is is really going to shine. All right. Um, okay, Jeff, here's one. Uh, with regards to whole building LCA, are we typically involving multiple professionals from the design team in, in these types of decisions? Or, uh, you know, just in your experience, have you, uh, what do you see uh, as, as the procedure for a good whole building LCA procedure versus maybe one that um, could use some refinement on a project? Yeah, so um, I, I think, you know, the, the entire design, or not the entire, but a, but a good portion of the uh, design team is, is important to, to do a, a good rigorous whole building LCA. Um, having having that, that guidance of of what you're comparing and, and what maybe you're going to, to leave out and and having that that list is, is pretty critical. Um, as I mentioned, there are some, some good resources on Woodworks to help those that are interested in um, pursuing that for the first time or, or trying, to, trying to get a little bit more involved in it. Um, 
I, I would say that that keeping in mind that the same functional use of the building while still allowing uh, some of those major assemblies to be switched out is where is where we think that the the best savings are going to be realized and the and the best way to to go about getting that um, that information out and and building a, a building that's got lower embodied carbon based on the, those models. All right, great. Thank you so much, Jeff. This was a really informative presentation. Marcy, if you'd like to go ahead and share your screen and provide us Absolutely. with our closing announcements here. We're at the top of the hour. Terrific. Thank you. And thank you, Jeff. And this concludes the American Institute of Architects Continuing Education Systems course. Thank you so much for being here and have a wonderful day.